How's it going, people? Welcome back to the channel and welcome to a video on 10 cars that you really need to get involved with ASAP before they end up being too ridiculous on price. All 10 of these cars are currently available for under £15,000, but over the last few years of doing YouTube, I have just watched their prices go up and up. Some of these cars have even featured in previous videos and now they are way more expensive than when I first spoke about them. So in other words, future classics. Remember that I'm in the UK, so prices in other countries may differ and remember that whenever you buy any secondhand car, maintenance, repairs, insurance, road tax, all that good stuff, is important to remember. If you enjoyed the video, let me know in the comments down below and hit the like button as well. 1,000 likes and I'll do this exact same video but under £5,000 instead. Hit subscribe if you haven't already. <clears throat> hit subscribe if you haven't already but without further ado, let's get into the video. <laughs> Many people love the Honda Civic, but the Type R that has really gone up in value is the DC5 Honda Integra, which has the K20A 2.0-litre inline-four engine, putting out 214 brake horsepower, taking it from 0 to 60 in 6.5 seconds. The DC5 is the fourth generation Integra, and in the US you'll know it as the Acura RSX. It sits on the same platform as the seventh generation Civic, and shares the same engine as the Civic Type R2, yet while the Civic goes for listed as three grand, the Integra is listed for a minimum of around 11,000 pounds, with 15 grand getting a 2003 example with around 80,000 miles on the clock. In my opinion, this is in part due to its rarity, with less than 750 Integra Type R's on the road here in the UK across all generations, and in part due to its massive cult following that it's gained, with people who would give pretty much anything to own one. With the previous generation DC2 selling for crazy prices in some instances, with one going in 2019 for $82,000, the DC5 has followed suit with owners just listing them higher and higher over the past few years. If you're after one of these, you might need to get involved very soon. There are some known issues on these like the O2 sensor, engine mounts, worn bushes and knocking suspension, but these are relatively easy to fix and other problems are generally just related to wear and tear. The Mark IV Golf is arguably one of the least loved generations of Golf, with the GTI being one of the least desirable, but that trend is entirely bucked by the beloved Golf R32, which has a 3.2 litre VR6 engine putting out 236 7 brake horsepower, which gets to 60 in 6.4 seconds. It was of course the birth child of the VWR division, which was responsible for multiple VW race cars during that period. They wanted to create the ultimate Golf and literally put every feature available to them into the car, to make it faster, better handling and more luxurious than every other car in their lineup at the time. In automatic spec, it was the first production car with a dual clutch gearbox and it also benefited from Haldex all wheel drive. Add on the more aggressive body kit and interior which really makes the most of the car's looks and you've got a highly desirable car which is the granddad of the R's we see today. £8,000 is around the minimum you'll spend to get one of these now which is crazy as I featured this car in my first ever list video at under £5,000 just a couple of years ago. £15,000 will get you a 2004 example with around 70,000 miles on the clock. They're reasonably reliable cars minus coil pack issues which are generally cheap to fix and a power flat spot which you can fix with an update to the ECU if this hasn't been done already. Tailgates are also known to rust as well as front arches so watch out for these too. The Toyota Yaris GR sent car fanatics and rallying enthusiasts alike into a frenzy when it dropped in 2020 as a homologation special which we rarely get to see nowadays. But it wasn't the first homologation special Toyota has ever done as they have a rich history of competing in the World Rally Championship and the Celica GT4 is another great example of an incredible homologation special from the brand. It has a turbocharged 2 litre inline 4 engine putting out 239 brake horsepower which gets it from 0 to 60 in 6.1 seconds. This is the ST205 Celica and it was the most powerful Celica available at the time with of course heavy influence from the Group A car in the World Rally Championship. There were actually 2,500 homologation cars which were required by the FIA, which share some more parts from the WRC car, but you're unlikely to find these as 2,100 of them stayed in Japan and just 300 came to Europe. This is the car that was caught using illegal turbo restrictors during the 1995 World Rally Championship, and for that reason it has been immortalised in history. £7,000 is around the minimum you'll spend to get one of these, and the most expensive I could find sits at £12,000 with 60,000 miles on the clock. Rust is a key issue on these, as are 
worn turbos, issues with fluids not being changed in a timely manner, and some electrical issues on the inside. From the buyer's guides I could find, it seems to have already hit the classic car experience in terms of ownership, so do be aware of this. It's no secret that I'm a massive fan of Alfa Romeos, and the 147 GTA is probably among my personal top three cars in this list, in part because it has the 3.2 litre V6 engine under the bonnet, putting out 246 brake horsepower, which gets from 0 to 60 in 6.1 seconds. This car is special for three main reasons. Firstly, that GTA badge, harking back to multiple exceptional alphas of the past, most notably the Julia Sprint GTA. Secondly, that engine, which sounds absolutely stunning, and in my opinion, there aren't many V6s as great sounding as one out of an alpha. And thirdly, that Italian styling. This car went up against cars like the R32 and S3, and a bunch of other German hot hatches, and yet at the time, it was the quickest car in its class, while arguably remaining the most beautiful. It wasn't hugely popular in terms of sales though, and there are just over 180 of them left on the roads here in the UK, with registered numbers falling year on year and sawned examples on the up. People are already putting these in storage and saving as investment pieces, so it won't be long before these become entirely unaffordable. £11,000 is the minimum you'll spend to get one of these and it will likely be an automatic, while for £15,000 you get a 2005 manual with around 65,000 miles on the clock. Check the history on the example you're after, make sure it's had cam belt changes on time and the water pump swapped from plastic to metal as these are key problems. Electrics are known for going wrong on these too, so worth looking to see what's working when buying yours. In my opinion, the X100 Jaguar XKR just gets prettier every time I look at it. You can get either the older 4 litre or more recent and slightly rarer 4.2 litre supercharged V8, which puts out 400 brake horsepower, taking it from 0 to 60 in 5.2 seconds. This was brought out as a Grand Tourer, with the XK8 being the slightly less sporty or powerful example to the XKR. It's derived from the XJS and shares its platform with the Aston Martin DB7, and is inspired to some degree by the legendary E-Type Jag. My fear is that one day, if we're still able to drive petrol cars, the XKR gets even half the classic status of the E-Type and just soars in value. They're already on the up, as these used to be easily available under £5,000 and are now at a minimum of around £6,000 and for fifteen grand, you are looking at a 2003 example with around 50,000 miles on the clock. There are a bunch of special editions too which are becoming highly valuable already, like the Victory Edition and the Silverstone, but the two XKs that really caught my attention as a kid were the ones in James Bond Die Another Day and Austin Powers Gold Member. Check and change gearbox oil on these every 50,000 miles, look for knocking from the suspension and problems with cooling. Electrical issues can be very annoying on these due to the complexity and difficulty difficulty of fixing them, which often ups the price. Wanted to stop for a moment just to say thank you very much for watching this video, I hope you're enjoying it. If you are, make sure you hit the like button, as I said a thousand likes I'll do it, sub 5k. Subscribe as well if you're new for two videos every single week. And let me know in the comments down below what car you think is a future classic. Obviously I think all 10 of these cars are, but I could think of a whole bunch of other cars I could add to this list. I have included the E46 M3 in numerous previous videos over the past few years, and every video it becomes more expensive at the lower end. It has a 3.2 litre inline 6, putting out 338 brake horsepower, which gets to 60 in 5 seconds. At the time, the E36 M3 hadn't been as popular as BMW would have liked, and the E46 had to bang in comparison. It sold incredibly well in both convertible and coupe spec, and came as either a manual or with an automatic SMG gearbox. That SMG is known for being great for track driving, but slightly more lurchy for everyday use. Now, The main reason why I think these are going to continue to rise in price is simple, they're M3s. E36 have already started to go up significantly and the E46 is following suit, with the CSL and CS Special Editions already worth a small fortune. In the BMW world, M3s are staple cars, and collectors will already have perfect examples hidden off the roads to make a sweet buck in future. £10,000 is around the lowest price you'll find these available for, and for £15,000 you're looking at a 2006 model with around 90,000 miles on the clock. Cracks in the rear subframe, head gasket and Vanos issues, knocking suspension, and the SMG box suffering slow changes are key problems I noted on forums, and electrics can can go wrong from water damage on these, so just some stuff to be aware of. When the 996 Porsche 911 hit the market, Porsche purists generally didn't like it. They didn't like the headlights and they definitely didn't like the fact that it was water cooled. However, now they're starting to hit classic status, particularly the more desirable examples, which is lifting the prices of the cheapest Carreras, which we'll now see for a minimum of around £11,000, with 15 grand getting a 2002 example with around 80,000 miles on the clock. You'll get a 3.6 litre Boxer 6 for your money, which puts out 320 
20 brake horsepower and gets the car from 0 to 60 in 4.8 seconds. It was developed alongside the new entry level 986 Boxster and introduced at a similar time with those fried egg headlights. Porsche really were up against it financially and had to update to the modern era and that's what the 996 aimed to do. And though it did upset Purist, it helped with sales significantly. The residual values were poor and these dropped massively on the second hand market. As with all 911s and pretty much all classic Porsches full stop, purists have fallen back in love with them and the increasing second hand prices reflect that. Name a classic Porsche from any generation before the 996 and it's already worth 30k plus, so I can't imagine it'll be long before these go the same way. IMS failure is the main problem to be aware of as a full engine rebuild will set you back around 10 grand easily and outside of that there are a few other basic issues that are well documented by Porsche Club GB. Be aware that repair costs on these are high if they do go wrong, so have a rainy day for ready. I have wanted a BMW Z4 M for quite some time now, particularly in coupe spec as a beautiful looking car on its way to classic status. It has the same basic 3.2 litre inline 6 engine as the M3 mentioned previously with the same specs, but it does 0 to 60 in 4.8 seconds, two tenths faster. Now the previous generation Z car, the Z3 M is already at classic status, with the coupe being the more desirable example, with prices up to £40,000. This has dragged up the prices of convertible Z3 Ms too. I imagine this the same thing is currently happening with the Z4M, as when I first planned to buy one a few years ago you could get coupes for around £12,000 and convertibles for much less than that, while now convertibles sit at a minimum of around £11,000 and coupes start at just under £15,000. Of course the Z4M has a fastback design, quite unlike the Z3M, but I think it's got its own allure. And many people agreed with this as it won an insane number of awards, many of them design related since release. Look for engine oil and filter changes every 7500 miles and for blockages on the roof drain holes as these can lead to rust. The engine issues remain the same as the M3 mentioned previously as well. I included the Maserati Coupe or 4200 in a video back in 2018 and prices have ever so slightly crept up since then. £12,500 is the lowest you'll find them listed for and you're looking at a 2005 example with 40,000 miles on the clock for 15 grand. And your money will be getting you a 4.2 litre V8 engine putting out 390 brake horsepower and a 0-60 time of 4.8 seconds. That engine is a Ferrari Maserati collab block which is also found in cars like the F430 and 458 in different guises which has helped maintain the car's value to some degree. The car was designed by the same man that designed classics like the 350 GT Berlinetta, Julia Sprint GT and DeLorean and in my opinion it is a very timeless design which will still look good in years to come which is why I think it's now on its way back up in price with the most expensive examples available for above 20k already. Its predecessor the 3200 has already gone up in value pretty well and I can't imagine either the 3200 or 4200 dipping in value given their steady recent rise. There aren't any majorly common mechanical issues surrounding the 4200 but build quality is known to be pretty poor. If you can get a newer example they are subject to better quality control from Ferrari and Maserati so worth spending a bit more for something more recent. Replacement parts aren't horrendous too considering the badge. The Porsche for example is far more pricey. Taking the top spot is the 875kg Vauxhall VX220 as it's so called here in the UK or the Opal Speedster for my viewers on the continent. Specifically with the 2 litre turbocharged inline 4 engine which puts out 197 brake horsepower, the least on this list, but the quickest 0 to 60 time of 4.7 seconds, hence I've given it the top spot. If you hadn't realised, I've organised these cars by 0 to 60 times to reduce bias on my side. The car was built at the Lotus plant in England and is incredibly similar to the Series 2 release, as Lotus needed to replace the car with something that would suit new European crash safety regulations. Lotus gained in investment from General Motors to update the Elise under the premise that they also developed a sports car for Opel, which is what we see here. As the Elise has gone up in value after reaching a low of around 10 to 12 grand a few years ago, the VX220 is following suit and in my opinion is a car that a lot of people, including myself, sleep on. Lotus design, build and performance hampered only by a Vauxhall badge that let residuals drop lower. It's still in the territory of being a bit of a steal, but any high end will start to match the Elise on price. £13,000 is around the minimum you'll find these listed for and for £15,000 you're looking at a 2003 example with 45,000 miles on the clock. Look after the suspension on these as catastrophic failures have been known and watch for synchro issues with the transmission. Other than that most of the problems I could find are build quality related and generally easy to fix. So I hope you enjoyed this video, if you did make sure you hit the like button I'd really appreciate it, subscribe as well if you're new, a massive thank you to the patrons as always for their continued support and to you guys as well for watching, I'll see you in the next one. Listen.